Good morning from Yummy B T V. Wishing you all well. Sending loads of love to you as usual. Now, much requested for, not who was the hardest, in my opinion, in a straight and RN with their physical abilities, with their hands and legs, etc., etc. But those men who couldn't really fight physically, who would probably be a match for any of those hard men with weapons in their hands. So I'm going to do my part one of that as requested by you lot. And up, there's probably about eight or ten to start with. And the first person I'm going to start with is the legendary figure called Cheeseman. Now, in my early days of Isla White territory, when I was a youngster, I witnessed him on a corridor going to education or going to work. Get this piece of wire. I forgot the name of this wire. You lot will be able to tell me. But it's metal wire. Like barbed wire, but not barbed wire. It was cutting wire of some kind. But there's a name for it. Um, Cheeseman went right behind him in the corridor. Walked up behind him as cool and calmly and casually as a man. Like who was going to go, and go for a day's work on a normal paid job. Just crept up behind him so neat and tidily. Put his hands around him. And put the wire around him. And ripped out the whole of his throat. Years later, in the category A's, again, think maybe Whitemore. Um, he had two swords, right? Two swords, two homemade swords, two, two homemade weapons made out of complete steel. And he walked up to a man on association and went straight up to him. With both those, with both those weapons, and went like that straight into his head headpiece like that. I don't even know if the geezer lived or died, but I know that Cheeseman is a legendary figure for serious violence with weapons. And those are two things that I saw. There are many, many more stories from other men that will be able to tell you more. But again, he didn't spend a lot of time on a normal location. Hence, no, well, we don't have to stop rocket science to understand that if you get what I mean when you've got a man like that running around. Now, my second figure, um, some of you've heard me talk about the relationship between Mary and Crusher, um, two, two men who dressed up in ladies' clothing. I think they were both doing life sentences. We've gone into a bit of background stuff on them before. Uh, but I put her, Mary McGill, the partner to Crusher, as one of the most dangerous, dangerous um, persons with a knife in her hand or a weapon of some kind that I ever, ever saw. Now, when she was working around the, um, the Arifs as well, there was bits of work that she did there too with a weapon. And there is those legendary um, stories about those two hits that were witnessed on the Isle of Wight at that time where she went full throttle, straight in, first go, one blow, neck and once with an eye as well. So I put Mary McGill up there as well. Not only that, I don't know if some of you remember that she went across the road to Albany and got rushed by got um like rushed by the whole yard. Um she turned up um as soon as she went on the exercise yard, five or six geezers run up to her and absolutely served her up like with weapons and stabbed her and jumped on her and blah 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 again the screws of the officers took long to get there but the reason why i gave her she didn't make one sound or anything like that and she didn't call nobody's name she didn't call nobody's name as far as i remember when she went to the block but how she lived that day through that beating again is testament to her mental, her mental strength or a dangerous mental strength, if you get what I mean. But she comes into the picture of being deadly with a weapon in Uncle Yami's book. Now, once upon a time, right, there was a geezer. I don't know if you lot remember him, but his name, excuse me one minute. His name was Peter Brown. I think he was from Leeds. Right now, in the early days of Swell Side and the Isle of Wight, the early runs, you know, the Blundersons, the Swell Sides, uh, um, the Albany's, the Parkhurst, you know, during the runs of the 90s that I've talked about um, quite, quite, quite um, consistently on this channel. Peter Brown 
was a bit not like me but a lot of people like me who were every single day looking for something sadly to smoke you know to put it blandly and a man who would take a hit at the drop of a hat now in those days in the 90s this one here was particularly talk about um was uh, somewhere in Kent, right? Uh, so we'll keep this a little bit uh, different. Not the Isle of Wight, but somewhere in Kent, if you get what I mean, uh, where we all were in the 90s. He walked up to a big no-name as well uh, and came up behind him and absolutely ripped him, him off. This man's got this scar up till today and how we lived that day through that is another, another, another um, serious, serious, serious um, piece of dangerous violence against another man where really and truly with those injuries he was hold trying to just he was holding his neck he managed to hold um his neck from the blood from squirting so he was walking to the office because there were no screws around so he managed to get there and get some kind of safety if you get what i mean this is was a name from um, south london as well for some of you that might remember those days in the 90s and it was also another one involving Peter Brown. Um, I always kept it kept it kind of easy with him. Me and him used to do little bits of graft together as well. Uh, Peter, I thought he was like he was he was a cool cool geezer. Well, some men some men are really in reality when, when that I've had dealings with him when I'm dealing with them. But the extreme level of violence that they're prepared to go to, um, you know, not just to get the job done, but to actually wipe you off the face of the earth with the with the method and the way they're coming and the places they're putting those weapons inside of you. So Peter Brown, again, another time, not one hit, two hits, Peter Brown, in one day, both of them, serious, serious stab wounds where those men, he used to have a saying to me that he didn't, whatever way he'd done his thing, he's making sure that those men, if he doesn't get shipped out or he doesn't get arrested or adjudicated for those offences, he makes sure that there's no way of them coming back to that to that wing so he doesn't have nothing to worry about if you get what I mean that was his um, um, ideology to the when, when he was going to commit such violence, so I got those three. Obviously, we've got to give Robert Maudsley a mention because he could not have a row to save his life. Now, I can't call on anything where I saw with my own eyes what he'd done on those wings way back in the day before he got into that segregation space for 30, 40 years. But other men that I have spoken to that when that alleged cannibalism happened where he killed a couple of inmates on the trot um I'm, I'm i'm not mincing i'm not twisting this story with robert maudsley but i'm hearing that the cannibal bit when he was eating like part of the brain and all that i'm hearing a lot of the time that that bit wasn't true in one of the stat in one of those incidents if you get what i mean that it was just blown up by the papers uh and blown out of all proportion so that cannibalism is very much debated by a lot of prison inmates, if you get what I mean. But I have to fit him in there um, as a man who couldn't really fight physically. But a man, of course, if you're not going to wipe him out straight away with the thoughts he's going to get inside his head um, physically, and you're not going to get rid of him, then the dangers are that he will come unexpectedly or first thing in the morning, you know, the early, early bird catch the worm, which he was famous for as well, with a couple of those murders, if you get what I mean. I have to put him in there. So that's four so far. Now, you heard me mention him quite a lot. And I would put um, Nicholas Minaj as one of the most seriously, seriously uh, violent men that I ever, ever met with a weapon in his hand. I see him a couple of times as a kid when he when he used to do all that and back like he was sword fencing, like he, you know, like he was really handy with a knife. I used to practice a lot with knives, sadly. That was a feature for me from a very small boy and I always used to carry uh, weapons and have different ways of, you know, moving knives around and that kind of thing, if you get what I mean. But Nicholas Vinage, um, his speed of thought when he catches up in arguments with people as well, and I've, I've told maybe told some of you this straight away, you are not 
going to get a chance. Do I put him on the scale? As Because Victor Cascada could do a little bit of Kung Fu, but he couldn't have a row uh, with the big, big, big hard men, if you get what I mean. Not physically, not as far as I know. I know that he could look after himself, but I wouldn't have said that he was a hard, hard, hard man physically, whether he knew a couple of moves or not, if you get what I mean. But I would put Victor Cascada um, a bit further than Nicholas Farnage. If you get what I mean. Because Victor was... I put him a bit further. As in Victor was more intelligent. And more clinical. I'm not as clinical as Nicholas Vernage, sorry. But his planning methods. And the way that he did his bits. With those weapons. We know about the time when he took out what's his name Ty. We know about the time when he also... You know, he... He, he got rid of someone on that occasion, but I wasn't even going to say another one there, uh, where he stuck something straight through somebody's chest as well. Um, but Victor's was was more cunning and more, you know what I mean? Like he was a proper, proper hitman. Like, that's what I'm trying to say. So I'd say he's not, Nicholas Vinage is not really like a hitman, if you get what I mean. He's just mentally deranged. And the first four that comes into his head, like many of those I'm talking about now, would be uh, to draw his thing out straight away while you're not ready like that, if you get what I mean. So with those two, three, four, five, McGill, Cheeseman, Morsley, who was at seven, that seven or eight I got, but I'm sure I had two more. Hold on, hold on, stay there. Smitherman. I've got to give Smitherman that place in that. Because for me, physically, he wasn't an uh, overwhelming presence. Uh, I used to think that I could, it'd be easy to just for me to even knock him out, if you get what I mean, by his presence and aura around danger, danger signs when he when he turns around and he confronts you or he mutters a few words to you and, he, you know, he waits for you to answer back those kind of things there. And those two things in those early days that I saw of Smitherman as well with those weapons in his hand, homemade metal spikes and a piece of glass on another occasion um, where he's walking straight down the landing and I was watching from the freeze as he was going on the twos and I was thinking, I wonder where he's going. And the man came out of the showers at exactly the same time. He seemed to time it to perfection and went like that. Woof, woof, woof. Do you see what I mean? All three done and dusted, don't stand a chance, the shock of it alone with the blood, with the blood, but you're, main, you're aiming for all the archeries, that kind of stuff. So I would have to put Smitherman in the picture as well with a weapon in his hand. Now, is there two more? I forgot them, Billy. I mean, why'd you get these bits? All right, I'll leave it because it's 13 minutes, right? But that's part one. Now, I'm going to come up with a few more, like uh, there's um, Scottish, Irish, there's others as well. So let me mix it all up. We'll just have this as a part one to start the day. Uh, but those are definitely not hard men physically. Um, but I'm tell you, telling you now, many of those hard men would be so, so weary around such such men that I've just, just, just described there. Sending loads of love to you. Let's hope to be back up very, very shortly.